Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more Warhammer 40k lore. Since we're on the subject of Imperial Knights, I figured I'd expand upon the topic by talking about Free Blade Knights as well. As one of their core aspects of the Imperial Knights is that they all belong to noble families and organizations, the local nobility of established knightly worlds. The Free Blades are a major deviation, as they have, either through their own choosing or due to circumstance, elected to abandon all of those connections, both to their original house, their family, their friends, their home world, and everything else, in order to fulfill some greater goal. Now, in some cases, it doesn't necessarily need to be anything particularly noble. It could simply just be a desire for good old-fashioned action, for example. An urge to venture out into the stars and kill many, many things with a six-meter-long chainsaw. But there are also those who abandon their houses for nobler purposes. Either a personal quest, a goal, revenge, or a myriad of other purposes. So, let's dive a little bit into them, shall we? The Freeblade Knights. Their stories, their personas, and how the hell they can even exist. Because, of course, a knight is a ridiculously complex piece of hardware, and running it without... Well, an enormous support infrastructure system provided by a knightly world with logistics, maintenance, spare parts, repairs, sacristians, blessings, etc., etc. Well, seems like a rather daunting task. But before we can get to everybody's favorite logistics, we've got to talk about how the knights ended up in whatever position they find themselves in to begin with. One of the easier examples might be something along the lines of an honor-bound vigil, as is the case of Vigilantus. I know, the, the name kind of gives it away. But this was a mysterious knight that died defending an agri world against a demon engine, a lord of skulls that went by the name of Gore Haunter. Vigilantes showed up on the agri world some three months before the appearance of the cornered demon, and there seemed to be nothing going on at all. In fact, the local populace were not particularly happy to have him there because, well, I imagine they started to think to themselves, why are you here? And why are you carrying that awfully big gun in my peaceful farming community? And the reason was, just like the farmers feared, something that was going to adversely affect their day-to-day -day lives, as a warp rift opened, unleashing a Lord of Skulls on their placid little community, butchering God only knows how many of them, before the knight managed to dispatch the demon engine with a point-blank shot from his thermal cannon, sending the malignant spirit spiraling back into the warp yet again. It cost Vigilantus his life in doing so, but it banished the demon for apparently another hundred years. So, if we extrapolate this story a little bit, we can relatively safely assume that the demon had been showing up on this particular world in set intervals for a very, very long time. And during one of his initial appearances, one of the long-lost predecessors of Vigilantus had fought the demon. Perhaps he had uh, lost loved ones to it, or battled brothers, or developed some sort of a reason for why he had to face this demon every time it rematerialized. Or maybe he had some sort of ancient bond of fealty to this particular agri world, or this particular village, or even to a long dead individual. Some sort of a bond of fealty bound the knight to this particular spot, or, alternatively, to this particular enemy, to the point that a new knight would show up every time, or, well, a hundred years. It is theoretically possible that it could be the same knights as Imperial Rejuvenation Technology could see a noble live far beyond a hundred, but this, we shall assume, is a tradition of the house. 
every hundred years or so, one of their premier members, or maybe whoever is piloting this particular machine, must go forth on the Freeblade quest to banish this particular demon. Should he fail, it becomes the responsibility of his house. Should he succeed and return, he is lauded as a hero and welcomed back into his noble lineage. Should he succeed and fall in the doing, well, he's still a hero. It's just that, you know, all that's gonna be coming home is the shattered remnants of his armor. Nevertheless, it makes for a damn good story. And it's even possible that the reason why he shows up on this world has nothing to do with the pilot at all, or even the noble house, or their history, or their lineage, or anything, but that it is simply in the machine itself. As the name Vigilantus, well, it is far from uncommon, in fact it is the norm for Freeblade Knights to surrender their family names and take on a pseudonym or even be entirely anonymous, but it sounds like almost the machine's name, doesn't it? Vigilantus, something permanent and vigilant. Perhaps there was a memory of the machine fighting this demon engine, and so every hundred years or whatever it is bound to reappear, the machine's spirit urges the pilot to go and face the demon yet again. It's pretty damn interesting. But seeing as this is every hundred years, plus minus three months apparently, the deployment time is somewhat limited and therefore probably doesn't require a whole lot of extra doodahs and nonsense around it pack a sizable lunch and you can keep yourself alive for three months. And it is not at all necessarily uncommon either that free blades do a specific thing, complete a specific objective, and then turn back into regular knights again, whereas there are others who do this for the rest of their existence. Now, on that note, let us expand upon the idea of leaving and rejoining a noble house a little bit. So obviously, the noble houses have extensive bonds to their house, to their world, to their family, to their familial connections, to the people who they owe fealty, etc, etc. We talked about during the Imperial Knight video that they take honor very, very seriously. And when they make a pledge of allegiance, that too is a binding contract to them. And so, a knight electing to take his incredibly powerful, incredibly rare, and incredibly valuable war machine and waffle off to do something else for god only knows how long, well, it's a bit of a problem, frankly. <laughs> As it is also not only you know, a logistical issue and a reduction in the military might of the house, but it could also mean that it jeopardizes the house's position to be able to fulfill their various obligations. Now in the case of a single knight it probably isn't as big of a deal, but there are circumstances in which entire lancers, or indeed entire large groupings of a house, go free blade, which would be a major problem. Now there is nothing to stop them from doing so, beyond their bonds of obligations, etc. Once a knight elects to go Freeblade, his liege lord can't tell him no or anything, and even if he could, would it matter? He's, he's a knight, what are you gonna do, shoot him? Oh, probably that's your only actual option, if you needed to stop him that bad. As if they do decide to go Freeblade, they have it means then, found something so goddamn important to them that they are willing to give away and give up on everything else that mattered in their entire life up until that point. Their family, their friends, their honor, their obligations, their homeworld, all of it in order to fulfill this greater purpose. Unsurprisingly, this could cause a fair old bit of friction. <laughs> Not necessarily, mind you. It can also be viewed as a somewhat honorable thing. If a knight goes freeblade to revenge a fallen comrade, for example, it might be seen as a glorious self-sacrifice, and the knight in question could be seen off with all due pomp and ceremony, and then be welcomed back with no real problems when and if he completes his quests. But in other circumstances, say for example that the knightly house is not particularly strong at the time, and the loss of even a 
single machine would be a major blow. The leader of the house, the king, the high king, might object rather vehemently to one of his young knights electing to go gallivanting across the galaxy because he felt personally slighted by a Nurgle bloatfly pissing on his armor at some point. In these cases, uh, they, they might be sent off without all that much in the way of fanfare. They might damn near have to sneak out the rear gate, in fact. And as for their return, well, there is no rule saying that a house must take back a knight upon the conclusion of his mission. It is all up to the High King, to the nobles, to the members of his house and anyone else who might have authority in that particular noble circle, as to whether or not an individual will be allowed to return to his previous house and resume his old rank or even to rejoin it at all, even as an aspirant again. And more often than not, the deciding reason between whether a knight is welcomed back or coldly rejected has to do with the amount of glory he's gained in his absence. A knight that has done very well, slain many big scary old demons and won copious quantities of glory on the battlefield, is likely to be welcomed back with open arms, where his name will be added back in again to the family registry and all of his count deeds will be listed alongside the house's achievements. Whereas, if he's been a bit of a lazy shit and not really pulled anything off, a young knight that wanted glory in the galaxy and wandered off without really thinking it over, then waffled from place to place without really distinguishing himself much, arriving too late to really lend significant aid to a battlefront, or someone who simply wasn't very good at piloting a knight to begin with, if they eventually give up and try to go home again, their reception is likely to be a hell of a lot colder. And whilst close family members might, potentially, still argue for their return, if they don't actually bring anything significant to the table, especially after having robbed the house of a valuable war machine for god alone knows how long, it might not be allowed back. And a knight can't simply just go to any house that will have him. If he has no familiar lineage, no connection to the house, well, he's a, a masterless samurai, a ronin, without any roots or home. Well, he could probably make himself a new one. He's still a knight. He's got a big old suit of armor with giant guns on it. I'm sure there is more than a couple of imperial generals that might welcome his assistance, even if he is a pinch disgraced. But it will never be home, and he will never be a true noble again. And so, of course, most nobles who have a task that they can return from, as that is not always the case, will want to make damnably sure that they've done a lot of fancy shit before darkening their family member's doorstep again. But that is, of course, even assuming that they have any intention of returning at all, as many Freeblade knights never do. Hell, most even never deign to explain why they're doing what they're doing, no matter what accolades they might gain. Take, for example, Auric Arachnus. This Freeblade Knight was already rather famous in the Ultima Segmentum, when he had been wandering around for quite some time due to his eye-gougingly poor choice of livery. We'll get to livery in the moment too, because Freeblades do have an element of livery, just not to the same degree or, um, well, as heraldic as their noble contemporaries but that are still with their houses. Anyways, Auric had been wandering around killing the enemies of the Imperium for quite some time, but he was just a knight. Just. Quote unquote. He had done nothing to gain any particular now, or any particular infamy either, as there are infamous knights as well. Not all Freeblades are nice dudes, or even really a, well, asset to those fighting alongside them. Very few Imperial Commanders will ever refuse the services of a Freeblade, 
Granted, the amount of choice that the commander might have in the matter is somewhat limited, but theoretically, if they could choose to deny their services, there are very few that would. But there are, as always, exceptions to every rule. There are those knights whose only interest is warfare and slaughter and blood and mayhem. Those who are closer to corn than the Imperium at this point, really, who will wander into battle heedless of the casualties they cause to friend and foe alike. These knights are dangerously close to becoming dread blades, the chaos version of knights, not called merely chaos knights in large parts because, well, dread blade just sounds really goddamn awesome. And hey, I can't really deny that it does, but regardless, infamy, famous, Auric was neither of these. But during the invasion of Hive Fleet Behemoth, he rose to prominence, was fighting alongside the Ultramarines on the world of Macrag, where he slew a Terranid dominatrix. This is one of those interesting little mixes of all the new lore too, mind you. The knights, relatively new, the dominatrix, what, fourth edition or something? I don't even think they're canon anymore, necessarily. I don't even know if they were truly canon. I'm pretty sure they existed in Epic? They might have been mentioned in the Tyranid Codex as well, although I can't remember right now. Anywho, the Dominatrix was one of those Tyranid Bio-Titan style things. A massive, enormous walking war machine with plenty of armor and offensive weaponry, but its greatest danger to its enemies was the ability to command vast swaths of the Tyranid hordes, with near pinpoint perfect precision, the likes of which even a Swarm Lord could hardly rival. They were the core key command centers of the Tyranid invasion. And a bit of a plot point as well, mind you. As their existence were. Well, they, they kind of existed as the biggest link to the hive mind on the world. Which in turn meant, of course, that when they were killed, it provided a plausible explanation for why the hilariously outnumbered and beaten up Ultramarines could launch enough of a counterattack to not only defeat, but decisively shatter an entire Hive fleet. Which apparently was unable to provide a better link to the surface. <laughs> Despite, of course, usually being able to do so just fine with Hive Tyrants and Swarm Lords and everything else, or, well, ah, Swarm Lord, theoretically, technically. You know, it strikes me that the Tyranids would be literally invincible if ever they realized they just need to invent a orbit-to-surface-capable radio creature. That could just be handed out willy-nilly to anyone and everyone who wanted one, rather than these enormous and highly vulnerable nerve center creatures that keep throwing themselves into the teeth of enemy gunfire. Anywho, the retardedness of Tyranid invasion strategy is not the topic of today's video. After his slaying of the plot point, Auric Arachnus became very, very, very famous indeed. And if ever he wanted to return to his home world, this would almost certainly have been his ticket home. And yet he shows no sign of ever cashing it, showing that for some knights, the the thrill of battle itself is not the driving force, nor is the urge to earn particular glory the driving force either, nor is it even a particular foe, as, well, Auric was around before the Tyranids were, so he is unlikely to have a particular grudge against them. Some of them just do whatever they do for reasons unbeknownst to anyone, and are difficult to extrapolate. Though I suppose lust for battle could still be at the very least a plausible explanation. Though again, unlike the more infamous ones like, say, the Crimson Reaper, for example, Arik Arachnus, whilst he does not really communicate with anyone, at the very least he doesn't actively endanger his own allies, so he has, at the very least, knock on full psycho just yet. Oh, and speaking of mysterious knights, 
This is obviously a part of the whole free blade aesthetic, isn't it? The idea of the wandering knight, the, the ronin samurai, the mysterious cell sword, the knight in black armor, and so on. In that you can make up pretty much any story you want and then build a cool little narrative around it. Or even, don't make up the story, just make the narrative and then let the mystery do the magic. This is one of the best parts of 40k, and one of the worst when GW decides to explain a bit too much. But it can also lead to some of the derpier elements as well. As mentioned with the new lore meets old lore, for example, there is a knight serving alongside the Black Templars called the Lost Knight. This guy apparently attached himself to the Black Templars upon the chapter's creation in the Second Founding and just never actually left. Ever. He just stayed. Eating their food, breathing their air, drinking their water, and killing their enemies. Which I imagine the Black Templars might actually take as a little bit of a negative, frankly, considering how fond they are of doing that themselves. Now, there are... Okay, so, it's far from impossible that a chapter of Space Marines would take a you know, certain liking to a fluffy little knight that tags around after them and pretends to be them. Like, look, Daddy, I can be a Space Marine too. Yeah, that's a real cute little mortal there. <laughs> but how on God's good earth is this even possible? So, presuming this guy isn't a demon machine at this point, He's been with the Black Templars for some 10,000 odd years, has he? How do they maintain him? This'll be uh, my entryway into the logistics part of things. How do they find replacement parts? Well, I imagine they just hit up the Mechanicus and go like, Hey, our pet knight blew a knee joint. And they'll be, you have knights? Why? Oh, we have one. Can we get some spare parts? Uh, sure. <laughs> Okay, I imagine even this would be a bit of a difficult conversation, really. It's like, because the Mechanicus will it will hear this and go like, you have what? Now those are supposed to be ours. Like, wh where did you get it from? Did you did you nick it somewhere? Like, is it there voluntarily? Did you abduct him? Mm. But they're here, so clearly they can get spare parts. They could potentially also machine some of their own stuff, but... I mean, this is golden age of technology level nonsense. I very much so doubt that the local Space Marine Armory is going to be able to pump these things out ad infinitum. Uh, even with a single knight, you know, there's only so many spare parts you're going to need, but in battle for 10,000 of years? I imagine a fair few chunks have been blown out of him over that time, wouldn't you? Not to mention, he's been alive for this whole time. He's never been seriously wounded. Uh, Impressive, I do suppose. And as for the pilot himself, how the hell is he still alive? Again, bearing in mind, rejuvenation technology in the Imperium is pretty goddamn advanced, sure, and there are dreadnoughts back from the age of the Horrors Heresy, but this isn't a dreadnought. For all intents and purposes, the knight's knight? Well, he's just a dude. You can keep him alive for hundreds of years, sure, maybe even thousands in extreme scenarios, but ten? Uh, clearly there is some golden age of technology shit inside of the cockpit, too. Or, he's dead. And he's simply now the Black Templar's local pet demon machine. <laughs> well, demon machine of the Emperor, sure, but... <laughs> demon machine nonetheless. To be fair, if he's gonna find any place that might accept him for his, uh, uh newfound status, uh, it, it would probably be the Black Templars, because they'd probably just look at that and go like, wow, he's so pissed, even in death, he still slays. Fair enough, brother. Now, come along for another 2,000 odd years. But... It does annoy me a little bit, the, the logistics behind it, because a lot of it is at this point, again, I, I talked about this briefly in the last video, that I consider the knights to kind of be on the dividing line between all the new games workshop, where old new, old, old new, old games workshop put a lot more thought into the backstory of a lot of their stuff. A lot of the things needed to be a bit more internally consistent before it was released upon the customer blades customer blades customer base there you go whereas the knights 
They're really goddamn cool, but they have these things that were clearly made primarily because DW were like, well, knights in space are cool, so let's have knights in space. And then somebody were like, oh, but there are like knights mercenaries and stuff that wander the stars. Like, that'll be cool. Yeah, that would be cool. Let's do that again. Without really thinking on, hold on a second, how is this going to work? Another beautiful example is Garantius, also known as the Green Knight or the Forgotten Knight. This guy has a very specific quest in mind, one of guarding a vault on the planet of Alaric Prime. This guy has been active for some 7,000 odd years, mostly out of sight for the local populace, but doing random nonsense here and there to protect the tomb of the planetary governor, the founding planetary governor specifically, who was apparently a pr pretty goddamn great dude, which is why this knight has been guarding him for 7,000 years. Without any sort of a support structure, whatsoever. At all. As Garantius, he's not really recognized officially. He's just there. And he always has been just there. He's killed local fauna that annoyed him. He's killed greenskins. He's killed dark eldar. He's killed inquisitors. He's killed chaos space marines. He's killed anything and everything that has annoyed him over those 7,000 years. And he's done all of that without a single spare part, without a single can of lubricants, without a single fuel change, without a single meal, etc, etc, etc. And he's still running just fine. Now I know, I know, <laughs> I know somebody out there is saying, Arch, just let it go, we know there's stupid knights in space, and I get it, I truly do, but ah, uh, it does tickle my pickle in just the slightly wrong way, doesn't it? Let's instead look at a much better example of what a true knight is supposed to be like, Lord Cyril. Lord Cyril didn't leave his house because he had a, a quest to fulfill, or an ancient tomb to guard, or a bond of loyalty to some random backwater lord, or he lost a relative, or his favourite puppy, or anything like that. No, 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 no. Lord Cyril took a long look at his knightly house and declared, Well, you fucking useless git. You haven't swung a sword in years. You're all women you are. I'm leaving. And so he did, as he figured that his house really hadn't been doing anything worthwhile for the Imperium in quite some time, and he was going to fix that. And if his house wouldn't do it alongside him, then by gosh golly, he'd go and do it by himself. And so he does, to this day. <laughs> now that's a Chad Knight right there, and I would imagine he probably got a fair few of his more ardent supporters to come along with him. He probably still has connections with the Imperium, definitely, probably with the Mechanicus. He's got his own Christians, probably. Maybe even a band of loyal retainers or worshippers. I kind of like the idea of the knights being sort of like the reliquary knights from Warhammer Fantasy from the Bretonians that will gather up their own little private armies. Not because the knight in question wants them, but because a bunch of random near do wells see this glorious figure and decides, let's follow that thing around. And unlike many other of the weaker, more effete knights, Cyril is not returning to his house. His house might return to Cyril one day, but not the other way around. <laughs> yes, Lord Cyril, the best Freeblade knight out there. And on that topic, heraldry and insignia. So, I kind of skipped over this one a little bit in the night video because, well, all the houses will have different heraldry and at the end of the day it's just heraldry. And it, it's, it's kind of boring heraldry as well, as it tends to be very simplistic. It's like, okay, uh, you know, we're a Mechanicus house, so half of our flag is going to be a cog. Okay, so far, so standard. And the other one is going to be whatever we fancy. Like our ancestors once fought, once fought dragons, so we're going to make it a giant lizard. Alright. 
you are. Uh, it, it's, it's heraldry, but real heraldry tends to be far more interesting, and Cyril has a couple of pieces of this. For example, he likes to cover his armor in nice, big, fat imperial aquilas to make sure that everybody knows that he, unlike his friends and family, knows his duty and is willing to serve until the end of times. He also has a battle banner hanging from his crotch, a weird but seemingly consistent habit amongst knights, detailing the more glorious exploits in his long and proud history of imperial service, or exceptional kills. He also carries a giant shield with the number 87, showing that he is the 87th pilot to pilot this particular suit of armor, which is rather interesting because it shows an individualistic streak. He is the 87th pilot, and he is known by his name, Lord Cyril the Indefatigable. He is an individual, whereas many of the other knights are more, well, they're more armor than they are knights, in some cases, literally. Another, incidentally, theoretical explanation for individuals like Garantius might be that the knight, again, is long dead, but it is now operated by the machine spirit, which would theoretically not make it a demon engine per se. It would just make it an abominable intelligence. <laughs> well... I suppose we're gonna have to argue some serious semantics at that point. Whether the machine spirit is an abominable intelligence, whether it's AI, whether it's a demon, or whether it's something else entirely, but still, it's not supposed to be operating the machine at that kind of level of sophistication, and definitely not for that kind of extent of time. Whereas Cyril proudly and clearly declares that he is an individual beyond merely his walking suit of armor. Again, the chaddest of Chad War Machines. And whilst not all free blades are as badass as this guy, they've all got the same thing in common. Namely, that they've found something so important that it overrides every other concern in their life. And it could be something noble, like hunting down the demon monster that harasses a local agri world once every hundred years. Or something as... <laughs> thoroughly selfish, as merely wanting to hear the boom boom of battle cannons yet again, or something utterly mysterious to the point where there probably isn't actually much of a story behind at all beyond, well, it sounded cool, so we gave the Black Templars a Black Templar in black. And there you have it, the Freeblade Knights of Warhammer 40,000. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.